uh, in our series of To the Future. And it's the whole idea of when we are here, um, kind of at a new year, it's at a natural point where we begin to examine how things have gone in our life and in the past year, and the kind of people that we want to be moving forward. And for the most part, we want to be in a spot where we look back and we look and say, there's actually things I'd like to change. I'd like to be able to move, to move in a different way. I want to be able to, uh, to grow deeper. I want to be able to be connected. Whatever it might be, you want to eat better, lose weight. There's always these things that we want to be able to do. But th- whenever we do New Year's resolutions, it has such a high rate of failure And I think part of it is because, well, we don't set good goals, but we also sometimes look at what we want to do and then completely change everything in our life to stretch ourselves, to be that kind of person. And we realize that that just doesn't work well. We can't sustain such big, drastic changes. And so that's why the gyms already at, what, the 12th day in January are probably a lot less full than they were on the 4th day of January. Uh, We just realize that, oh, working out these muscles hurt, and there's a reason why I didn't do this before, and I don't want to keep doing it, and maybe it's just, you know, it's just easier if I don't do it, and all these drastic changes we had planned for our lives end up uh, just going back on the shelf, and for, unfortunately, we can sometimes live in just a cut and paste existence, where we've just taken what we have done, and we just copy it and paste it into the new year and say, oh, let's do more of the same. But that's not what God wants for us, and that's not what he is doing in us. And we're looking at this series of To the Future with the idea of uh, going to the, uh, the verse in Isaiah 43, where, Isaiah, where the uh, prophet Isaiah is prophesying, and he says this. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. And again, this isn't like forget it, like wipe it from your memory. But we just understand that the things that we have happened, that we've done in the past, what we have done in the past, we can sometimes dwell on that and cling to it. And God wants us not to forget it, but he wants us to see the things that has happened so that we can move forward. In the next verse, he says this. He says, put the next one up there. It says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland, that God is doing something new, and if we are so focused on what he has done in the past, we will miss it. And for the Israelites, this is a a verse about Jesus that was going to be coming, and he's like, if you don't get your eyes off of the things that have happened in the past and anticipate what God wants to be doing, what I, or what, this is God speaking, what I want to be doing in you, Israel, you are going to miss it and you are going to cling to the things of the past and totally miss out on what is happening. And we just have this tendency as people to idolize the things that have happened before and we can miss what God wants to be doing in our lives. And if we live in a cut and copy Um, world where we just cut what we have done and copy it into the new year, we end up just taking what the good things that have happened in the past and not opening ourselves up and holding our hands out loosely for the things that God wants to be doing in our lives. Last week, we looked at the idea of uh, the deeper life, that we could use this idea that large doors swing on small hinges, where instead of transforming everything of our lives and throwing out everything and radically redoing how we exist in our world, we can actually implement these small hinges that are just a small change but have the power to move a large door over time. And we looked at the deeper life last, last week where we figured if we implement one small change, the power of reading scripture four times a week or more, it actually yields huge benefits in our lives, these auxiliary benefits. And if we do this and continue it on in the year, we will position ourselves to look back on 2020 and say, God did something in me because I was in his word frequently. It's this very small hinge, but he does all these big things. And if you want to, you can catch up uh, in your bulletin. There's information. You can join our Bible in a Year reading plan that we're doing as a congregation. Uh, I'd encourage you to be a part of that. uh, Or use our weekly readings that are in the bulletin each week to follow along. And this week, we're looking at the connected life. But it's not connected life like the smart homes things that we have and the different smart gadgets that connect everything together. Uh, We're looking at the connected life and what it means to be connected relationally. And I think this is a really big 
felt need. If you've ever experienced loneliness, you understand how important connection is. Because loneliness is probably one of the worst feelings. It's, it's different and sometimes more powerful or maybe more debilitating than even grief can be. Yet, in a time where we have so much access to being connected, loneliness remains an epidemic. You don't have to look far on Google to see all the different research studies that show how increasingly connected we are, yet how increasingly the levels of, or how big the levels of anxiety and loneliness are becoming at younger and younger ages. That in our connectedness, we find ourselves isolated. And I, you've probably experienced it in some way. I remember when I experienced it, I had moved out of the house. I moved to, uh, to Winnipeg to spread my wings and to just see what the world had to offer for me. I got a job. I was enjoying it. Uh, the pay was, I guess, good for someone who was 18 and I could pay my rent. Uh, but I'd moved to the city and I didn't know anyone. It was the city, Winnipeg. And I didn't know anyone. Uh, and so I spent a lot of my time, basically, if I wasn't working, I'd just kind of sleep in or lounge around the house. And I found I had all this extra time in my day and I didn't have any friends or people to be connected to. And so you know, I thought to myself, I said, well, I know what I could do. I'll just get a second job. I was working, at, uh, I was working as a cook, so I didn't start work until about 5 o'clock at night. And I'd work till about midnight. I'm like, I have all this time before 5 p.m. I'll just work a job that goes from 7 to 4. And then I'll, just, then I'll walk across the street and start my other job. I'm like, this is great. I know what to do with my time. Uh, and it, I had way more spending money all of a sudden, uh, and I met more people. I had connections with another workplace. But after about three months of doing this, I just felt so isolated and alone that I was surrounded by people. I was going to church at the time. Church has always been a part of my life. But even in the church that I was at, I was still in with a church of about 200 people, lots of people around, but I still felt alone. And it's in these moments of being connected, we can fool ourselves into human contact being the equivalent to deep connection. But it's just simply not the case. We can have all these different friends on Facebook and followers on Instagram and whatever it might be, and we, we see into people's lives in, in ways that we haven't before, and yet it still feels so lonely. And that's not what God has for us. God has something so much more for us, and he wants to meet that need because there's a real, tangible human need of being connected it's one of the amazing things about the doctrine of the incarnation. So we just finished Christmas where we celebrate the incarnation, which is that God incarnated himself, which is put on flesh. Uh, so he came to be flesh with us. And so his physical presence with people was actually something to celebrate. He's not just a God that transcends and he's beyond who we are, but he's a God who is intimate and close to us. He's one who had friends and spent time with them and laughed and worked, and there was physical contact, and it was important because it changed everything. The gods of the, the pagan gods that were around, that were aloof, they were just, they were off. They were the people who were, uh, the gods who were toying with people, who were out there to, to make life miserable for them. And that's why you have, you look and you see all the, the pagan mythology and the gods there. They're just cruel, mean gods who have fun at human's expense. But the God of the Israelites, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who, who saw us and created us, he is the one who wants to have an intimate connection with us. And so we celebrate that he came to be a person with us. The presence of God in flesh is so important. It's not just about a knowledge of God, but it's an experience of him. In the same way, it's not just a knowledge about your spouse or a knowledge about your best friend or a knowledge about your, your friends in college or a knowledge about the people around you, but it's a connection with them that makes it meaningful. So we are going to dive into figuring out how do we live a connected life and what does that look like? And to do so, we are going to jump into the book of Hebrews. If you have your Bible, you can open up to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll have the, uh, the scripture on the screen if you'd like to follow along there. 
And we're going to uh, see what, he, what the author of Hebrews is getting to. And he's going to make a couple different points, and we're going to kind of walk through these verses as we get to the application here. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, okay, whenever you see a therefore, we're, this might be well. Whenever we see a therefore, we know that he has, the author who has led up to this point has been making a case. He has been uh, saying, because of this, because of this, because of this evidence, because of these truths, because of whatever it might be, all of this has been building to a therefore. And so he says, therefore, because of all the things he's been talking about, the importance of Jesus Christ, we get to a therefore. Because Jesus is greater than, in this case, in Hebrews, he's talking about Jesus is greater than Moses, Jesus is greater than the high priests, Jesus is greater than the law, Jesus is greater than Melchizedek, which is some weird priestly figure. He's making the case that Jesus is more important than all the former things of the past, and God is doing a new thing through Jesus. And so we get to this beautiful therefore. Therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have the confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Okay, we'll stop there again just for a second. Most holy place. This is Jewish language. The temple was created. And inside the, as the temple was created, you have these walls that would, be, that would be the outside. Then you'd have the court of the Gentiles where people who weren't Jewish could kind of get closer. Then there'd be another court and another court. And then you'd have the altar. And then in there, you'd actually have the holy of holies where the Israelites, where God had said that his presence would dwell. And only the high priest could enter that presence once a year. And so you did not enter the most holy place with confidence. You entered it with fear and trepidation and much solemnness because if you got it wrong, you could be struck dead by God. Entering into this holy place was not accessible to anyone except one person once a year. And if he screwed up, he could pay with his life. But he's making the case saying God has done something different. He has actually given us the ability to approach God with confidence, not in fear and trepidation, but what Jesus Christ has done allows us to enter towards God with confidence so we don't have to be afraid. Uh, verse 20, by a new and living way, he opened for us this curtain, that is his body. Again, that's a reference to the temple. There'd be a curtain that would be blocking off the most holy place. When Jesus was crucified, that temple, the curtain in the temple ripped from top to bottom. That curtain then gives us access, and this new curtain, which is his body, actually ushers us into his presence so that we can approach God. And we have this great high priest, so Jesus is now the one who intercedes for us. He's making this case because of all that. Uh, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Again, this is more, uh, more temple imagery where the, the priest, who they acted as the mediator between God and man. God had set up the priests to, to be in this, uh, this setting so that if anything had to happen, if God had to speak to man, it was done through the priests or, or in case through the prophets if the priests weren't following along. And, uh, and so they would then have to make sacrifices to atone for people's sins. So if someone screwed up, you sinned, you murdered someone, you stole from someone, you, you, you cheated on someone, you had an affair, you, whatever it might be, they would have to then take the life of an innocent animal and they would sprinkle blood on the altar as like this thing that it was the, the, the animal's blood and not yours that paid the price for your sin. And so the author of Hebrews is now writing saying, our hearts have been sprinkled clean through what Jesus had done on the cross. So we have this great faith that we are now changed and we've been cleansed from a guilty conscience so that we can actually draw near to God. And this is important. I want to speak, if you are a Christ follower, so if, if you're a Christian here, and you are living with guilt and shame because of things that you have done in your life, because of things that may have been done to you, if you have guilt or condemnation or shame, that, oh, hear me clearly, is not from God. 
You are free from this guilt and shame. And so what Christ has done is that he has paid the price. So you are free from that. You get to repent from it and turn and experience life. You don't actually experience condemnation. The writer of of Romans says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so if you have been a Christian and you've been crippled with this guilt and this shame for the things that you have done or failed to do, know for certain you don't have to carry that anymore. God has taken care of that and wiped you clean. And if you need to have some healing from that, just come up to the front afterwards. We have a prayer team here. And we would just love to pray that prayer of blessing over you and just get rid of that shame because it ought not to cripple your life. Christ has paid for it. You can then enter, because of that, you can enter into the most holy place with the confidence that what Christ has done, you can approach God in that way and you can have freedom from that shame. And if you're here and you're maybe not a Christian and you're not sure what it means and you are carrying that baggage of shame as well, know that freedom is available for you. You do not have to carry it anymore. Shame will want to cripple you and condemn you and God wants to release you from that and so that you can have a right standing with him. And this is important because it leads into what happens after this on the next verse in, Romans, uh, in Hebrews 23. Uh, and following. So he says, because you are cleansed free, because you have been cleansed, because you have been washed clean, because of what Christ has done, here's what actually has to happen. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. This hold unswervingly or cling, let us cling to the hope that we have, it means that there are things in this life that want to pry you away from this hope. It means that there are things in your life that will try to derail you. There are things in this life that will try to uh, 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 cause you to stumble and to take your eyes of what Christ has done and put it back onto your shame. It's the things that, that are going to keep you from being the person that you want to become. We need to cling to this hope, not because we might lose it, but because we can take our eyes off of it and forget it. Uh, In the parable of the sower, uh, Jesus is speaking and he talks about how the gospel goes out and things happen in our life and some soil bears fruit. And he talks about this one soil that bears fruit. The roots go down, it bears fruit, but then the weeds choke it out. And he says the weeds are the cares and the worries of this world. If we aren't careful with our hearts, we can be choked out by the, the, the promise of what God has given to us. And it's ours just to cling to. He has done all the work. We just got to abide in him and he will bear fruit in our lives. We have to hold unswervingly to this hope. Because here's a truth that I want you to have, is that you won't drift to be the person you want to become. You don't drift to be the kind of person that you want to become. If you want to be a certain type of person, you need to actively move forward in that way. You need to cling to truths. You need to put into practice the things that you know. If you want to be the kind of person who loses weight and gets fit, you, gotta, you don't accidentally get fit. You don't accidentally become someone who can run a marathon. You don't accidentally become someone who saves money. I don't know what happened. I have all this money here now. No, that happens because you were diligent with things and you had a budget and you planned to it and you saved some and you were wise with how you did it. And so all of a sudden you have the savings. You won't ever drift to be that kind of person. It requires you to hold tight to the truths that we understand. Because as we get into this next verse, here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where the connectedness comes in. Verse 23, 4. It says, let us, so because of all this truth, because of what God has done for you, here's where the rubber meets the road. Consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. This is interesting. How does all of this truth about what Christ has done and how he has washed you and given you the confidence and taken away your shame and your guilt, how does that actually impact our relationships here? Well, the truth is, is that shame will drive wedges between your relationships with other people. 
shame is going to be the thing that will keep you from engaging with someone else. You are going to be so scared that as soon as they find out the cracks that you have in your life, that you don't ever want to reach out in that way. You're just scared that if you do, they're going to see who you are, and so you better not let them see that. So let's put on the mask. Let's build up the wall. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say anything to people because they might find out about my past and my history, and that shame will cripple you. It'll keep everyone at arm's length. You'll have a thousand followers on Instagram and a thousand friends on Facebook and you'll have all these different connections and it'll be an inch deep and a mile wide and you won't ever feel connected. You will feel so alone. And you experience this. We experience it. Our kids experience it. Because the shame will say you're not good enough and if someone sees who you are, they won't love you. The gospel says God sees exactly how filthy and broken you are. And he loves you so much he sent his son to redeem you. And because he has done that, here's the hope. You now get to be vulnerable with someone else. And you get to actually love someone else. You get to spur one another on. The spur one another on is kind of has the, the, um, like the, the provoking, has a word like provoke. Let us provoke one another in love. But you can't provoke one another for love if you don't let anyone come near you. If you don't cling to what God has done, you will continue to put up barriers around yourself. You can't be provoked into doing good deeds for, with other people and for other people because you're just so scared of what they're going to find out. But you will not grow in maturity and in faith and in your depth and in your personal life, you will not grow as a person until you let someone provoke you in love and good deeds. I've been the recipient of this. People have challenged me towards love and good deeds in ways that I never would have stretched myself if it weren't for that relationship where I could trust them. People who have challenged me to to go and to be more generous with my money And they went and said, see, I've been generous. Look at how I'm living my life. I am choosing not to do certain things with my lifestyle and my my vacations and how I the cars that I drive. And instead, I'm going to be more generous with that money. And I look at them and say, man, I want to be like him. And so suddenly I start making different ch- changes with my money and how I deal with things. I'm like, I, I don't need to do this and maybe I can live this way instead so that it frees up more money for me to be more generous and I never would have done it and then someone else had said, follow me, watch me. I never would have challenged myself to, to be able to be in a spot where, where praying would be comfortable for people in bold ways until someone else did it for me. And I was the recipient of it. And they brought me along and they all of a sudden they're stretching me and I find myself praying for other people differently. Praying and engaging in God's word differently and challenge myself spiritually to go deeper. And if I hadn't have brought people into my life, that wouldn't happen. Man, I'm running out of time. Okay, next verse. I'm, got me preaching. Uh, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. So here's the important part. Because God became flesh and he dwelt with us and there's a personal connection because he has made you clean, you now need people. If you don't have people around you, you're just having an empty spiritual experience. You need to have people in your lives engaging with you flesh to flesh, face to face engagement. Have them into your homes. Because if we don't, if we get in the habit of just going, you know what, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I don't need to have these things. You will find yourself drifting away. I have uh, friends, and you probably do too, where they'll post something on Instagram of a beautiful lake or something like that, and like, ah, oh, church at the lake today. And I get what they're saying. They're saying that they met God in a spiritual way in, in nature. I've done that too. I do it when I'm on my bike. When I'm cycling, I have, there are spiritual encounters I have when it's just me and God and nature. Absolutely. But if I rely only on that, I'm not experiencing church. Here's the thing. I need you to grow my faith. If you aren't here, you're robbing me of the growth God wants to do in my life. 
Because I can't do it on my own. I need to have other people challenging me and provoking me to love and good deeds. And if you aren't showing up to do it, you're robbing me of what God wants to do in my life. And if I don't show up, I'm robbing you of what God wants to do in your life. And so we need each other. And if we give up the habit of being together, you're just going to drift. And before you know it, you'll be off course. And like, I don't know how I got here. I was having coffee with, uh, with someone who, uh, kind of an acquaintance, this is about a, a year ago or so, uh, and uh, grew up in a Christian home, church was always important, and uh, he hasn't been a part of church for, for five years. He says on Sundays, him and his wife listen to a, a sermon, a, a podcast or something, maybe play a worship album, and they just kind of go about their business. These are all very good things, but he's also missing the opportunity of what God wants to do in his life through someone else. And he's denying someone else of the good things God wants to do in their life through him. And a spiritual experience is good. They're important. But the meeting together needs to happen because you cannot divorce Christ from the church. Christ came so that we can have these physical encounters with each other and be in community together to build each other up and to be the hope of the world so that people can come and they say, I can't believe who is gathered here together. They have nothing in common except for Christ. And so it's not that they're all from the same background or same tax bracket or have the same hobbies or interests, but Christ has brought them together and and I don't ever see this anywhere and that's the beauty of the church. Meeting together is so important. All right, I got to keep going. Uh, what's what I have next? Um, oh, so here's the thing. Uh, let's put up the next slide. Uh, Kara Powell, who is a researcher and author, and I think she works at the- uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, spent a ton of time trying to figure out what makes people's faith stick into adulthood. What happens for kids and teens as they leave the home, go to university and school? How do we see that some people have a faith that sticks and some people walk away from it? And there's many different things that are involved in how we prepare uh, our our young adults and our kids to have a, a growing and vibrant faith outside of our home. There's ways of, uh, one of the things was providing a place where you can experience doubt and not be condemned. Doubt is okay. If you have doubt as a Christian, that's okay. You need to experience it and wrestle with it. Doubt that drives you further into Jesus is good. And we need to have safe spots where people can say, I'm not even sure if I can believe that this is true. That's okay. We need to do that. But this five to one thing was probably the biggest thing that she came away with. And we, as a church, have, we follow a uh, plan to protect which ensures that we have proper ratios to help prevent child abuse in different things. So depending on the age of the kids, there's like one adult for three kids or one adult for five kids or whatever it might be who are screened here. This one, Kara found out, is that one of the biggest factors for kids sticking with their faith is having five adults outside of mom and dad who had a relationship with that child in a church. You want faith to stick for the next generation? You are the one who has to be engaged. Because they need five adults. My kids, my daughters, who are now entering you know, junior high, which is terrifying, and high school next year, which is like, I can't believe this is happening. My kids need you as an adult to invest into their life for their faith to stick. They can't, they can't ride on my coattails. Your kids can't ride on your coattails. But here's the thing is that I need you to be here. I need you to be engaged and be active and to be caring for people for faith to be able to stick and to grow. And whether that's uh, kids serving on teams, on worship teams or in the back, on tech, or being a small group leader for kids, being engaged is probably the biggest thing that makes faith stick. It's not surefire, but it's definitely a big component of it. Being present matters. What do I have next? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, so here's here's a big change. And it's a fundamental way in how we change and one of the things that we want to be doing. We don't want to be a church where you know everyone. It's simply just impossible. We want to be a church where everyone is known. Subtly different. Do you see it? We can sometimes feel like if we don't know everyone, it's it's scary. It's like, I don't know who all these people are. 
There's new people here all the time. This doesn't feel like what I'm familiar with. I want to make sure I know who everyone is. But if we do that, what we end up is like having a Facebook list with a thousand people where we know everyone, but we don't have any real connection with them. One of the changes that we've been making in our different programming, in our student ministry, in our kids ministry, in our adult ministry as well, is the moving to the importance of groups, where people can be known in a group, where it's not that I need to know who everyone is, but I need to know that I'm known. And I need to know that that the person that I encountered feels known and welcomed. And that's where the real connection happens. That's where the real uh, um, feeling of engagement and connectedness comes in, is being known by someone. And we like to think we can do it on a big scale, but we, we just can't. The reality is, once you get past about 50 people in a room, you just don't know everyone. We like to think that we do, and if you're depending on how extroverted you are, you might actually have a conversation with all 50 people in the room, and some of you extroverts might have a conversation with everyone in this room before you go home, and your introverted spouse is just hanging out in the car, just waiting for you to finish your conversations. We understand that. But there's a chance where we need to be in a group where we can care for each other to celebrate the things that are happening in our lives, to pray for those who are mourning, to sit with those who are mourning and worried, to surround people when there's a diagnosis and, you're, and you don't know what to do or how to process it, to celebrate when things go good, to have a barbecue with. Those kind of connectedness things are so important, and if we try to do it where everyone has to know everyone, we're, we'll just shrink until we do know everyone. And then we just kind of become a club. And instead of being a light to the world here in Morden, we just become this club where we just feel comfortable because everyone knows each other. And other people seem scary because we don't know who they are. And so the big shift that I want us, the, the, the small hinge that I think we can engage is this. And it might look a little bit different. It's being present. Being present might mean that you just increase your, your frequency of attendance on a Sunday morning going, I need to be present, not because necessarily I need it from God, but I need to be present because God wants to use me for someone else. And so because of that, I'm going to be present. Or it might mean that you've been present here at church and what the next step for you is to be moved into a group so that you can feel known and you can be known. If that's you, if you need to move into a small group, we have, uh, uh, if you go to mordenalliance.ca, there's a tab that says ministries and life groups. And there's a life group that's there. It says, uh, help me find a life group. And if you go there and just punch your information in, it's real, just real basic stuff, either Pastor Henry or my wife, Joanne, will connect you with a life group. Just to say, we need to get you connected. And it's in these life groups where we want that care to be happening. Now, if you've been in a life group for a long time and you're, if you're a life group leader, maybe what the application of being present means is that you move from meeting once every two weeks or three weeks to saying, you know what, it's really important to be connected. We're just going to meet every week. And whoever can make it, can make it. And if you can't, that's okay, but we're going to meet every week because it's important to be known. Because if without each other, we're just going to drift and we're not going to be the kind of person that we want to be. And so I want to challenge you going, what's the place where you just need to be present? Or maybe what being present looks like is that being present and you come saying, my goal is to look for someone new. And we're just aware that when you're here, God once is preparing you to minister to someone else. And if you've come to church and you are broken and depleted and you need to meet from God, you know what God's going to do? He's going to use someone else in this room to meet that need for you. It's so important. The actual physicalness of being together in a, in a congregation and in a group is so important. God wants to use those connections for us to be known. And if we are present and we make the changes saying, you know what, life group is always on this night and so I'm just going to say no to everything else that wants to meet on that night because I have life group and that's how I'm going to be present those kind of changes, you'll see that your connectedness grows, your passion and your love for other people grows, and that you then actually become the recipient of God's grace through others. And if we have these practices that we put into place, a year from now we will look and we'll say, God is using us relationally in ways that we didn't think were possible because we were present with each other.
I'm going to invite the, uh, the worship team back up as we have a chance to, uh, to respond in song where we get to celebrate that God is doing things in our church and the, the, the beautiful uh, power of being together in a congregation. So why don't we stand and we can worship through song together. You guys can have a seat just for a moment here. The importance of meeting together in Jesus' name gives us a place where people can find connection and community, where it's not the things that, that we have in common with each other, but it's actually it's Jesus Christ is the one thing that we have in common with each other. So some lyrics from a song, and you give me grace, please. <laughs> you might recognize the song depending on your music tastes. We got winners, we got losers, chain smokers and boozers. We got yuppies, we got bikers, we've got thirsty hitchhikers. And the girls next door dress up like movie stars. We got cowboys, we got truckers, broken hearted fools and suckers. We got hustlers, we got fighters, early birds and all nighters. And the veterans all talk about their battle scars. Mm -mm, I love this. Anyone know the song? Love this bar by Toby Keith. If you listen to the whole song, you just take bar and put church there, and boy, do you have such a beautiful painting of a picture of the community of Jesus Christ, where there's mercy and grace and love and acceptance, but it's not because we're gathered around alcohol, but we're gathered around the living God who loves us and offers us so much joy and hope. God wants to use you to be a blessing to someone else. Don't rob that person by not being present. If you'd like prayer for anything this morning, come up and, and our prayer team would love to pray for you. Apart from that, go with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We'll see you back here next week.